So welcome everyone to the second installment of our as yet online only Helmholtz Centrum Gestacht and Hamburg Machine Learning Seminar. Today we're covering some intro talks from some of the members of the seminar, uh, showing a little bit about themselves and their work. We are going to cover a paper on how to apply convolutional networks to spherical data. And uh, we're going to go into one paper in depth, which is kind of a 3D mesh-based approach. And then we'll cover a few other approaches to spherical data. Um, more superficially, just do a very quick um, survey of the field and what's out there. And then we will uh, just open up discussion. Um, so just two quick announcements before we get started. First, all the material we're talking about, all the papers, all the blogs, all the Wikipedia articles and so on, will be linked in the YouTube description and we will also be setting up a web page for this seminar, which will be emailed to the mailing list um, really soon. Um, and second announcement, we could use a volunteer to present a paper some week. So if you have an idea, if you have something you've been reading, you're curious about and you want to present, just uh, let us know as soon as possible and you can present that next week. So then uh, without further ado, I will turn over the uh, discussion to um, Juliana and you can introduce yourself and start off with your presentation. Hello, thank you, David. Everyone can hear me? We hear you fine. Uh, you can start your screen share whenever you like. Okay. Um, should I put this in full mode or like this is okay? I, I think it's fine. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Juliana. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in Hatsatier with Edu uh, and also with Johanna Bea and Thomas Ludwig. And I try to uh, study improvements of European summer climate predictions with neural nets. So I do here a little bit of background. Um, so why do we care about this? Um, if we have a look on current state of the art dynamical models, we see that they have rather limited predictive skill. And he with um, a set of 10 members simulation uh, covering the 20th century. Here on the left, we have uh, anomaly correlation coefficient represent the skill of the prediction of means level pressure anomalies. Um, if we had a, a good predictive skill, we would have rather dark red values in this plot. And we see that this is not the case. If we zoom this um, over this black box, uh, um, just have a look on Europe. We, we have here on the right a time series of these um, of these predictions. In blue, we have the ensemble mean, um, and we have a very high spread as represented by these little dots, which are one of these ten ensemble members. And uh, these against error twenty C, you see the relation over the the twentieth century. So we, um, we try to understand why this is fair in predicting European summer climate. And we know that uh, for European summer climate, uh, different from winter, we have a broader range of influences. And it's very important to understand the extent of each of these mechanisms uh, are influencing uh, every year forecasts because they bring memory to the system. And in general, these models perform very poorly in predicting um, both the leading modes of variability in summer, which are the East Atlantic pattern and the North Atlantic oscillation. So what I try to do is the first question I try to answer is if I can physically constrain the dynamical seasonal predictions using this information uh, with neural nets of uh, the representation of these teleconnections. And I also, uh, in the next step, I try to predict uh, from spring which mechanism dominates the variability with neural nets. So this is a little bit very uh, superficially the framework I use. So in the, at the moment, I'm focusing on the first uh, two columns, so left and the middle one, uh, where I use self-organizing maps. Um, in an unsupervised way to define a baseline with error 20 CV analysis. 
and then I project any each of the ensemble members um, onto this base baseline defined with the self-organizing maps to constrain the ensemble uh, climate predictions. Um, and in the next step, I will uh, use a different set of simulations with the ground ensemble and convolutional neural nets and recurrent neural networks, exploring the predictors of these teleconnections to be able to predict um, not relying on these reanalysis data uh, in this uh, in, in high cast mode, but in real forecast mode that I can try to predict which mechanism will dominate each summer. Uh, and just to illustrate, I put two slides of results. One, um, here we have on the left the ACCs, so the anomaly correlation coefficients, uh, with the full ensemble. We have that uh, with these refined select members that I, that I do, and we find better predictive skill in some parts of Europe. And we also find uh, a better relationship between the spread and the error. On the left, we have uh, over dispersed members in most of Europe. Um, if, we, if we don't do any post-processing, and if I do what I'm doing, then on the right, we see that we have more of the ideal value, which is the white, which is one. Basically, the spread to error ratio is better. So that's it, more or less what I do. Thanks a lot. That's really interesting. I can ask just one really quick question. So in, yes. the, in the machine learning you're doing, what do you think is a limiting factor? Is it the amount of training data, the, uh, you know, the amount of processing power you have, algorithms or something else? What would you most like to improve? Um, well, that's, um, I think the method itself, um, is okay for what I'm doing at the moment, but is to find a way to work on, um, more of this, uh, right arrow I put here, where I try to, where I use a, a method that allows me to predict in the future, which mechanism will be more relevant hmm. while what I'm doing at the moment is more like using past information and predicting what I already um, sort of identified. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. That's, that's great. Um, next presentation is uh, Tobias Finn. Thank you. Can you hear me? Here you fine. Yeah. Perfect. I will switch to a whiteboard. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm Tobias Finn. I, I'm uh, I'm with the University of Hamburg and the MPI, MPI for Meteorology and the University of Bonn. Um, and and uh, and I'm a third year PhD researcher. And 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 my main topic is about strongly coupled data assimilation between atmosphere and land, and and how we can how we can assimilate atmospheric observations into land. And one of the main problems with this is that the that the, couple, that the coupling between the atmosphere and the land is, is very nonlinear. And almost all, all current data assimilation is based on a, on a, on a linear, linearized assumption or, and a linearized yeah, assumption um, approximation. And so I, I, I also switched a little bit over to, over to machine learning and, and, to, and to neural networks because, new, of course, neural networks are are, are capable to 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 fully re represent an, a, a very nonlinear state, and so I I I, I currently do 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 also some also some research on 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 how to use how to use um, variational autoencoders for for data assimilation or especially adversarial variational autoencoders. So um, why we can do this, um, I, I can I can try to to explain it a, a little bit. So um, basically, in, in data assimilation, we have two we have two two different kinds of of, of, of data. On one hand, uh, we have a previous forecast, normally called first guess. Mm. And second, we have of course observations which we want which we want to incorporate into our first guess. So we want to combine our our first guess and our observations into an analysis.
And with this analysis, we normally would start a new, a new, new weather forecast run. So and and basically, in in in, in almost all in all data assimilation methods, we we try to we try to reconstruct our observations based on this analysis. And and one could of course see that 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 this kind of that this kind of structure is 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 very autoencoder like. So we have observations which are encoded into a latent state, and then this latent state is decoded into into a, into a reconstruction. And so and and and, and normally normally in, an, in data assimilation one would now do do a Gaussian assumption for this. Um, for this observational space, normally a Gaussian assumption here on this lower lower end, on and also a Gaussian assumption here on this end, and then one could analytically solve this problem with a, some kind of a linear regression. So it is then a linear then a linear network. Um, and so, and and what I'm doing now is that I that I use that I use a use a, um, an adversarial network. So I, I use an additional network, which tries to which tries to 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 discriminate in my analysis. So which says which says to me the probability that. That, that, that a sample is either the first guess or the analysis. So probability that this is the, let's say the first guess. And then one, one could show that, 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 by, that by, doing, by, by doing this, by doing this, this approximation to the, to, to the, to the, um, to the distribution, so so to yeah, by doing this approximation, um, or we we do a, an an approximation of the so-called Kullback-Leiber divergence. So it's a it's a it's it's in some kind of similarity between between two different distributions, and 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 on one hand we have the distribution of the first guess, and on the other hand we have the distribution of the analysis, and and by we can approximate the kullback leiber divergence without knowing the distribution explicitly. So we have an we have an implicit um, approximation, and yeah, and, and so and and I think this this will be in in some sense the future of the of of, of data uh, of, of data assimilation such that such that we aren't constrained to, to to linear assumption or to or to Gaussianity. And yeah, I think this would it be from my side. I hope it it wasn't too confusing. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, let me ask one quick follow up question again. So when you say yeah. the distribution of your unknown system state, given your observations and your previous yeah. state, your your kind of state posterior, right? If yeah. it's not yeah. going to be Gaussian, what kind of distribution is it? Is it kind of like the generative distribution of a GAN, where you you take a like a um, a Gaussian distribution, pass it through a feed-forward neural network, and then um, and then you get something out on the other end, or is it something else? No, so 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 normally, or, or at the moment, one would one would use one would use, of course, ensemble data estimation. So use an ensemble of weather forecast, and then and then we have then we have a, some kind of a distribution for the for the first guess, which can look like something like this or or some or some or something else and so it, yeah it, it, this would be in the in in in, in the model space it, it is it is really implicit so it, it is really or it, it is a it is again in 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 model space so so it's it's really implicit so we, we don't have to specify the distribution of the model space it's it's learned it's learned by the new by the second neural network Okay, thanks a lot. That's, that's really interesting. I'll be interested to see how this um, how this leads to some progress in in um, weather prediction and data assimilation.
Yep. Um, thanks a lot. Okay, so we have one more talk. Um, Tobias, you can turn off your screen share, and then um, Leonard will Leonard Marian will do the third presentation. Okay, um, so I'm trying to hopefully share the. I oh, know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, should I? Yeah, it's. Uh, I have to. Um, okay, hopefully this works. Now. I have some permissions here. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, hopefully this works now. Yeah, mm -hmm. should. Sh Looks good. Okay, can you see uh, that? Oh, yes. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so. Um, Right, my uh, project is called Machine Learning Methods for Assessing Causal Links in Heterogeneous Data Applied to Climate Change and Health. A bit heavy handed, sorry about that. So, um, I should briefly mention uh, um, that um, we're working uh, together. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Leonard. I'm working at JRIX Climate Service Center Germany, that is part of uh, the Helmholtz Centrum Gesacht. Uh, and yeah, so um, I should briefly also mention my colleagues. This is a joint project together with. Um, uh, the Helmholtz Centrum München, um, and uh, we're working there with the colleagues Wolfgang zu Castell and Machia Valizadi um, from the Computational Science Unit, and Alexandra Schneider and Katrin Wolf from the Epidemiological Unit, and uh, there's also my colleague uh, Lawrence Bauer, who's the seminar, but can't be here today, and he's the PI. And uh, our project um, is um, carried out within the uh, uh, framework of Digital Earth. Um, that's a project that basically tries to foster the use of, of data science and machine learning uh, in, <clears throat> in the sciences and, um, and also to foster collaboration between different Helmholtz centers. Okay, so what is uh, the project all about? So uh, just as a little um, motivation of sorts, myocardial infarctions, um, uh, so just got MI uh, for brevity, a major cause of death worldwide, according to the WHO. Now, MI is known to occur more often under extreme temperatures. There can be both heat waves or cold spells. Now, what we want uh, to, to do, uh, want to, what we want to achieve in this project is we want to model due to sustained heat waves. And ultimately, we'd like to project that risk into a future under climate change, where of course heat waves are expected to um, occur more frequent, frequently and with greater intensity. And also, we want to use uh, data science and machine learning uh, well, to do the modeling, but also to establish new links between health and climate science, which we think is uh, an important uh, research field in the future. Now, <clears throat> uh, I here's a little data and methods uh, part. So data is, of course, uh, very important for any uh, data-driven approach. And the main pillar of our approach will be uh, the cohort health data and the MI registry. So um, the CORA study is a large-scale um, medical study um, called Kooperative Gesundheitsforschung für die Region Augsburg in the Augsburg region in Bavaria, Germany. And uh, uh, it's basically a cohort study. I will go uh, uh, say a little bit more about that uh, next slide um, and, and how the data is structured. But that basically um, uh, gives the ability to correlate uh, environmental factors and health risks. So we're also going to use weather observations. Of course, uh, we're interested in modeling the effects of heat waves. So we need to uh, yeah, to know when heat waves have occurred in the past. And for that, we will use historical climate observations from DWD and from the Reclam uh, project. And then also we'd like to use NDVI satellite data to estimate green and water surfaces because um, these might have an effect on, on how likely someone is to suffer from MI. Um, then we're also going to use socioeconomic data. Some comes from the core study itself and other data we're going to acquire from the Bayerisches Landesamt für Statistik. Then we also like to include air pollution data uh, from various uh, sources, uh, data on building age, uh, and so on. Um, uh, in terms of algorithms, um, we think that um, uh, 
due to uh, data scarcity, we expect uh, to maybe use methods more like linear regression, random forest, powered vector machines, maybe not so much neural net networks, which I think a lot of the research that uh, you all are doing is probably focused on. Uh, but of course, you also need a lot of training data. Um, now, uh, going back to the core cohort data, so basically uh, a certain group of people has been monitored uh, in terms of their health status uh, since the 80s. Uh, every couple of years, there is an examination done by physicians um, to monitor the health status and various uh, socioeconomic uh, details of of the patients, and this is the, the, the base data that we want to use to um, to then uh, couple the environmental um, <clears throat> factors uh, to the health outcomes. So I, I see I'm a bit over time, so I'll speed up a bit. This is uh, basically a, um, a, a workflow of the project as we imagine it. Uh, I will not go into much detail uh, <clears throat> for reasons of brevity, but basically there's of course so data collection, which is always a big factor. And this is the state we are in right now. We just started in November. We're still uh, working on acquiring data and processing it uh, so that we can use it. And then, of course, there will be um, a large part which will be a feature selection and so on, and the model selection and validation and so on. I think you, you all know this probably better than me. So I'll just um, uh, go one more minute, sorry. Uh, into what we expect uh, to be the challenges so of data. It's very heterogeneous in, 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 in space and in time. For, for instance, uh, DWD observations are sometimes uh, every couple of minutes you have data. And these health um, examinations uh, of, of the cohort, uh, they happen every five years. So uh, there are huge gaps in terms of how the data is um, yeah, it's distributed in space and time. And then it's, of course, a question of, of representation in, in the sense data formats, data structures, and so on. So this is one of the challenges uh, that we are facing. And it is a highly multifactorial problem. Um, we were interested specifically in, in the um, uh, in, in heat waves, but there are so many uh, possible influences on, on the risk of suffering MI. Uh, so many uh, confounders that, yeah, uh, that isolating this uh, influence will certainly be very challenging. Then there's the issue of number of features versus data quantity. So in terms of uh, medical science, this core data set is very extensive, but in terms of uh, machine learning people, it is not very big. There are 5,000 people about in, in this group, but of course not all of them ever suffer an MI. So, so we have a problem of data, data scarcity, which is why we're not currently thinking of, um, of using neural networks, but maybe that is something that can be discussed. And also the spatial relationships are difficult to pinpoint. This is also due to the fact that this is medical data. It's anonymized, so we do not know where the patients live or work. And that, of course, makes it very difficult to, to, to analyze spatial relationships. So sorry for going a bit over time. I'm done. Thanks a lot. That was really interesting. It, it'll be quite fascinating to see what methods you end up using with the heterogeneous data and the, um, the limited amount of training data. Um, so I'll be excited to see how that, how that develops. So let's save any more questions for our three speakers so far until the general discussion at the end. And in the interest of time, let's just launch right in. Um, so if you can stop sharing your screen, I will take over the yeah, screen. I'm, I'm trying to get back to this <laughs> Zoom program. I don't know. It, it's not opening. What, uh, well, so try it. clicking at the, the top of the screen where you see this green. Ah, OK. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, <laughs> Technology. No, um, uh, yeah. Right. So I, I will launch right into the um, uh, discussion of the paper. Um, and we'll cover a fair bit. Um, it's not going to be super in-depth, but it, it's great if, if something isn't clear or something is very interesting or if you have a question, just uh, just chime in. I think. You can somehow raise your hand on the group chat um, on Zoom, or you can just, or, or you can try typing. Uh, let's see, can someone want to try typing into the Zoom chat? I can try myself if I figure out how to do it. Um, yes, oh, we have some chats going. Yes. 
Okay, great. So I can see the Zoom chat and we can see people raising their hands. And I've also got an eye on the YouTube chat if somebody wants to contribute there. So um, if you want to contribute at any time, just chime in. Um, okay, so we're going to get to this paper now. I'm very, I'm excited about this paper, but also just in general about um, this whole line of research of how to incorporate, um, how to incorporate uh, spherical data into machine learning algorithms. It's not a trivial problem, and there's a lot of different approaches that offer different advantages and disadvantages on, on various problems. It's a really quickly developing field, and there's a lot of really clever notions that we'll, we'll get into a bit. So before, though, we really get into what these approaches are, I want to do a, you know, a 60 second or so review of what a convolutional network is. So we have our input data going into some layer of our neural network and we want output data and both the input and output are going to be a series of images. So let me find this animation here. Yeah. So you can see we have a, we have an image with three different color channels. One, two, three, say red, green, blue. And then we have different filters for each color channel. These are three by three squares. And we pass the filter over the image. We multiply the pixels by the filter coefficients and we get a number. We get, in fact, three numbers for the three filters. We add them together and we get an output. And as we pass the filters over the image, we get outputs uh, for each pixel of the convolutional layers output, right? So we have three input channels, we have one output channel, and we have three filters. This is a convolutional network. And it's very powerful because we can have very high dimensional data, lots and lots of pixels as input and lots and lots of pixels as output. But with just a small number of free parameters, that is the coefficients of these three filters, we can process a lot of data. And the key insight is that we're assuming that the relevant computations we perform on these images are invariant over space, right? Wherever we are in these images, we're going to do the same local computations. And then typically, what you do is you would have these filtering operations, which are linear, and you would intersperse them with, say, um, nonlinear operations, right? So I have my input, I have performed my filtering op operations on it, we get a bunch of outputs. We then do nonlinear operations on each pixel of the output uh, independently, for example, it could be a smooth sigmoid function, it could be a very popular ReLU, which is just zero for negative inputs, and and the identity function y equals x for positive outputs. And then we repeat the process. So filter, nonlinearity, filter, nonlinearity, and that's basically a convolutional network. So they're extremely successful. They're great for performing all kinds of operations on images. And they're great for mapping images to other images. They're great for assigning a label to an image, like is this a picture of a car or a dog or an airplane? Um, and we want to use these on spherical data. So the challenge in doing that is that the assumption of, well, we're going to perform the same local computations in each part of the data is no longer really valid when you have a latitude, longitude projection. And this can happen in earth science, obviously, when we have global data. It can often happen, as we'll see in a later example. Now, I'm not sure. I hope we have some colleagues from material science. I'm not sure if anyone joined this time. But... It happens when you have uh, the input is the features of some molecule, which you often represent as a, a field in uh, spherical coordinates as well. But in this case, we have, we have this issue that if we go with a latitude longitude projection, so we have a grid of points as inputs where we have latitude and longitude, and then we have values of anything, temperature, pressure, uh, wind speed, whatever we like, as we get closer to the pole, those points get closer together. And the shape of the filter sort of distorts and changes. Whereas when we're at the equator, it's much more uh, of a broad region if we look at a three by three grid of, of pixels. So the difficulty is that we try to learn these rules of what information to extract from the image at every point in space, but we end up applying a different rule in different parts of the image. And this leads to um, a lot of difficulty, and we don't end up getting the right um, answer. 
So, um, we're going to start off with um, what what this approach is, and then we'll we'll go into this in a little bit of detail. We'll figure out what uh, Jang et al. does. What is their strategy for calculating these features we can extract from these spherical images that are going to work the same whether we're close to the equator or whether we're on the poles. Uh, we'll go in detail into how they did it, what the results were on a few benchmark problems, and then we'll quickly, quickly survey the rest of the field. Okay, so um, what do they do? So they start with the icosahedron. So instead of a latitude-longitude projection where we basically take the sphere and flatten it onto a rectangle such that we end up with very closely spaced points at the poles and more distant points at the equator, they use an icosahedron which is a regular um, you know, th uh, spacing of 3D points. So here's an example of an icosahedron. It's one of these platonic solids. It's got 20 faces, 30 edges, 12 vertices. All the vertices are an equal distance from their neighbors. And if I look from the center of the icosahedron at two of these neighboring vertices, the angle between them is 26 and a half degrees. Okay, so instead of flattening the sphere onto a latitude-longitude projection, the first thing they do is they use an icosahedron. So they map these uh, 12 vertices onto the sphere. Of course, you want to have more than 12 points. So in addition to, uh, to just having each of these vertex points where the um, sphere and the icosahedron would intersect, we also have all the points in between which get projected onto the nearest face of the icosahedron. So how does this work? They talk about different levels of, um, of detail. So just like in a latitude-longitude projection, if you're doing a climate model or some you know, um, um, density field for molecular modeling or something, you have these functions and spherical coordinates. Um, and you have some resolution of your grid and latitude and longitude or whatever of the system. And with the icosahedron, you also have a grid. So I'm going to open up a... Um, where do I, I want? Yeah, so here's an example from a text from, a, from another paper here. So here's the original icosahedron, right? It has very few points, very coarse resolution. So the way they get to higher resolution is they take each of these triangles, right? It's got uh, 20 faces that are all triangles. What if we take one of these triangles, like this red triangle, and we divide it into four smaller triangles? And then we have a bunch more points, right? We added three more vertices for each of these triangles. We take all these vertices and then project them out onto the sphere. And we get this triangulation of the sphere. This is called um, the level one triangulation of the icosahedron. But what if we still want even finer resolution? Well, then we take these four triangles and we subdivide them again, and this is level two. So we can keep subdividing and subdividing. We get all these tiny triangles. We then divide each one of these vertex points by its length to get back out onto the sphere, and we have an increasingly fine triangulation of the sphere. And that's what they do. This is their data structure. Instead of a latitude, um, longitude projection, they use these geodesic spheres. Okay, so this is how we represent our data, but how do we actually perform the convolutional operations, right? So a convolution is, going back to our example, it's a linear filter which we pass around the data, and we get outputs at each point. We need to do the same thing now on our high-resolution triangulation arising from our icosahedron. So how do they do this in this paper? They, instead of multiplying by these 3x3 three three filters, they do something much simpler, in fact. They are going to calculate, so, so, Given our input data, which is going to be defined as a bunch of values for each channel, it's going to be a bunch of values at every one of these vertices. So what we're going to calculate as our convolutional filters are essentially the derivatives of this function with respect to latitude and longitude. It's a bit complicated and abstract, so let me repeat that. We have a function with its values at every one of these vertices. We're going to calculate the derivative of that function with respect to latitude and with respect to longitude. 
So how do we do that? Um, the, the first thing we do is we need to calculate a, a function which is not just defined at these vertices but everywhere in between. And to do that, here I'm taking um, an image from a textbook, right? If we have each one of these triangles from our triangulation of the sphere, we have values at each of these three points. So that's enough to fit a plane. We fit a plane to the values of the function on this triangle, and then once we fit a plane, we can get the slope of that plane with respect to any axis. So now we have something like a surface composed of all these triangles on the sphere. We can calculate the slope of that surface with res the height function, if you like, the slope with respect to latitude and with respect to longitude. And there's formulas for how you do this. But essentially, you calculate the slope of that plane with respect to latitude and with respect to longitude for each of these triangles. But now we want not the derivatives on the triangles, but the derivatives of the vertices. So to calculate that, we take a weighted average of the slopes at all the surrounding faces with respect to latitude and longitude. So this gives us derivatives of our input function, which is defined at all these vertices with respect to latitude and longitude. So these are two outputs we can calculate. A third one is very simple. We just take the input as an output, right? So the identity function. And as a fourth one, so there are the four outputs that they're using. Um, our, the fourth output is what they call the Hamiltonian, um, which is essentially defined using this, uh, I can find, yeah, this formula here. Um, so in addition to calculating the derivative of the input on the mesh with respect to latitude and longitude, they calculate this extra thing. You can read up on it in the references, but intuitively is something like the curvature of the function. Or if you look on their example, you can also think of it as sort of an edge detector, right? So in this example, the input channel is just a land mask, is say one on the land and zero on the sea. And then or rather the other way around, zero on the land, one on the sea. And then, so we calculate the gradient of this with respect to latitude. We get this value, a set of values in the sphere. We calculate the gradient with respect to longitude. We get th these values. And then we calculate this curvature or edge detector and we get this. So we calculate these three things for the input channel. And then instead of having these free variables which are the coefficients of the convolution filter, we have these free variables which are just coefficients that get multiplied by these four outputs. Identity, derivative with respect to longitude, derivative with respect, or, uh, with respect to latitude, and our edge detector or curvature. We add these up, each one of these outputs multiplied by the filter coefficient, and we get the output of our convolutional filter. So, there's actually fewer free parameters than there were in this three by three filter convolution. Here we had nine free parameters per image per input channel, whereas here we only have four, um, which is useful for reasons we'll talk about um, in a little bit. But this is basically what we do. For each input of the convolution layer, we calculate these four um, outputs, and then we weight them by the filter coefficients. Um, and so one really nice thing about the way they set this up is that like a regular convolution is only local, right? The value of the outputs only depend for each vertex only depends on the values of the neighboring vertices. And it's linear. All four of these are linear functions of the neighboring vertices and themselves. So like just like a convolutional filter. And then of course in between these linear operations we intersperse nonlinearities like thresholding, sigmoids, um, whatever we like. Um, okay, so um, just as an aside, we started off with the icosahedron, we then subdivided it into a finer grid, and then we calculated the gradients of a function on this grid with respect to latitude and longitude as well as the curvature. But in fact, all these gradient and um, curvature detection algorithms, all these things that we're calculating based on our mesh, they work for any mesh. It doesn't have to come from an icosahedron. It doesn't have to come from a sphere. All it does is, all it has to do is be made of triangles. So this is kind of an interesting thing. The paper, the, the filters, these four filters they use are actually much more general. They can be applied to a torus, a Klein bottle, whatever. But 
Uh, they don't use that in this paper, but potentially it's much more flexible. Uh, okay, so this is how their operations are defined. And then we'll go on a little bit about how they're used, but this is a great point to stop for questions. If anything is unclear, if anyone has a comment, if anything is maybe not intuitive, um, this would be a great time to ask. Uh, you can ask on the chat um, or you, of, of Zoom or of YouTube. Hi, this is Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Great. Um, explain how to come to that method when coming from a regular long lat grid. So usually you don't have the usually you don't have the information on the Hiko Hiko Zaira grid. So you need to come to that point at some uh, in your operation. So is there are they discussing how to go back and forth? between lat and long grid and that stuff? That's a really good question. So yeah, you'll have to do some kind of interpolation. Um, you'll have to do some kind of transfer, right? So if you have a lat long grid, you'll have to transfer these values, which are maybe much more densely spaced near the poles and more spaced out of the equators. You'll have to transfer them onto a grid which is more evenly spaced across the sphere. And of course, every time you do these transfers forward and backward, you may be dealing with information loss. Of course, if your original data is very high resolution and you're just subsampling it in the first place to make your lat long grid, then it's not such a big deal. You just do a different um, representation of that data as you downsample it, as you kind of coarsify it. But if your original data was lat long and you have to go to this method, you may have to either increase resolution or just lose information. So this is potentially a problem. It's also a problem when you compare these different methods to each other. Um, um, so if you have different data sets that start off as lat long grid or they start off as you know icosahedral triangulations of the sphere, it's not so obvious you know if the comparisons are always fair. Um, so this is, this is a good point. You, but generally when you do this, what you do is you transfer the data to the format you want once, you do all the training, you do all the, and then if you want to go back, you can transfer it to the other format when you do the evaluation on testing data. So uh, to, uh, Tobias, you have a question as well. Or well, you have your hand up at least. Sorry, didn't unmute myself. So, well, not, not so much as a question, but just two comments. So first, uh, yes, indeed, the, that that kind of uh, is is then necessary. However, when I read this, I th my first thought was, well, this fits very nice with the icon models, right? So this is sort of you can you can stick to the native icon grid to some point. I'm not sure if if uh, how straightforward this would be to implement, but it's at least a very nice thing that that crossed my mind here. Second comment um when i was reading this i was in fact wondering mention so the um the uh the layers up into the atmosphere and down into the ocean and looking at, at one of the equations i i would have to look it up there was have all of these things together yes so equation four in the paper all of these uh, parameters so I was wondering, um, including that dimension, uh, top and down, uh, sort of in the, in the atmosphere, atmosphere, up and down, uh, would it just be as simple as including a fifth parameter here, or am I missing something? Because it's then latitude, longitude, and some sort of uh, layer height, and then and then the uh, the Laplace operator, and so on, and, and the identity. Would would this does it make sense like that? Uh, it's a very good question. I think there's basically two ways one could do this. One is to go from, um, to basically increase the dimension of the meshes from, from, so right now these are 2D meshes embedded in 3D space. Um, they're all made of triangles. Mm -hmm. And if you go to meshes which are connected in an additional third dimension, this kind of triangulation of the icosahedron is not so simple. You may have to look at some other way of dividing up space. So it, it may be not so simple. Um, one could look at the textbooks for these three models and, and maybe they're using tetrahedrons or cylinders or something. 
and one could try to do that. Basically, a lot of the techniques you would borrow to compute gradients or the Laplace operator are basically borrowed from techniques for, for finite element methods from uh, numerical solvers for differential equations. Um, so you could definitely find something. A simpler approach, though, might be to just treat the different vertical levels as um, different channels of input. So, you know, we have different functions which are defined by different input channels and they're all functions on these vertices, but you can have different value, different channels for different uh, vertical levels. And then to combine them, if you wanted to calculate, for example, a, um, a gradient uh, in the vertical direction, well, you could basically do this by taking the correct linear combinations of these channels, right? So if we go back to our original convolutional network, we have, you know, coefficients within each filter, but if we scale all of the coefficients of one filter, we're actually changing the relative inputs of these different filters. So by doing the right relative scaling, we could actually compute uh, finite differences across channels, and this could be a way of getting gradients in the uh, on the third axis. So whether this is better or whether it's better to go um, you know, to include the third dimension in the mesh is not clear. Um, the, the multiple channels is probably simpler to implement, but may ultimately be less effective, especially if you have a lot of vertical levels. So this is a good question without um, a clear answer, I think. Um, Tobias, you still have your hand up. I don't know if... Uh, <laughs> If there's another question. Okay, now you. Um, there's another question from the chat. Uh, maybe the across channel gradient, um, a saving of parameters is uh, is much bigger compared to using a mesh. This is this is um, also possible, um, and th this is a, a key point which I think we'll come to soon. Is wanting to use as few parameters as possible, and why is it a good thing, and uh, what does that gain you? Um, Okay, so let's, let's just quickly go over the applications they use this on. Um, the first thing is a spherical MNIST. So what is um, MNIST is basically a very common data set in machine learning where you show the neural network pictures of, of digits of numbers 0 to 9. And, um, and you ask it to output which digit it was shown. And in the spherical MNIST task, they took these digits, they mapped them onto a sphere, and they showed them uh, these, these sphere, spherical data sets to the network and asked, okay, is this a four, is it a nine, is it a six? It's particularly interesting in that the orientation really matters, right? The, uh, the orientation with which it's mapped into the sphere distinguishes, say, a six and a nine. Um, okay, so given a bunch of these spherical data sets, the neural network process it with, with a lot of different um, layer, well, a whole bunch of layers uh, with these convolutional filters defined using these, uh, these four coefficients, right? So that at every layer you have all these input channels, you calculate these four outputs, you do uh, a weighted average with these four coefficients, and then you add those up to get an output. Um, so, um, they, they stack a lot of these layers together with nonlinearities in between. We'll look at the architecture in, uh, in a second. But then the final output is basically a list of 10 numbers saying, okay, what is the probability that this spherical data set represented a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, and so on. Um, so we, we have some results here. They compare to uh, Cohen et al. 2018, which we might touch on later, um, and SphereNet, which we'll also touch on later. But two other approaches to uh, spherical uh, inputs for neural networks. And you can see they get much better accuracy. This refers to the, the, the fraction of these inputs which were assigned the correct label. Is it a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, so we, we have very high accuracy while using relatively small number of percentages, about the same as this um, S2CNN method and, and about three times less uh, than, uh, than SphereNet. Um, so they have this nice performance. So I think um, 
it's also nice to just stop and, and kind of take back all these abstract concepts and put them in a little bit practical terms, right? So in earth science, one often asks, okay, you're processing the data. So what is the grid size in degrees? What is, if you're doing a latitude longitude grid, how big are these squares on your projection map? And it's nice to ask a similar question here. So they're doing what they call a level four projection. So they're saying, starting with the icosahedron, they're dividing this four times. So here they've divided it. Here you start off with the icosahedron, you divide it once, two, twice, three times. They even go one more to four times. So they divide these triangles one more time. So in effect, this is our original 26 and a half degrees on these edges divided by two to the fourth or 16. So our grid size in this icosahedral um, MNIST, our digit recognition on the sphere, is about 1.7 degrees. Our, our triangles are about 1.7 degrees uh, long. Um, okay, and so then they got these nice results. I wanna very briefly just not talk about too much of the design choices, but just go through the architecture they use to give an intuition of what's happening in this network, which is getting these really nice results. So we'll just, um, we'll just follow through very briefly. Um, so they start off with, um, with their um, icosahedral triangulation, right? So all these triangles with a length of 1.7 degrees covering the whole sphere. And there's only one channel, which is the brightness of the you know, light and dark as, you, as someone has written a one, a two, or three, or whatever on this sphere. And then they do this convolution operation. So they calculate these four outputs, the, the input itself, the gradient with respect to latitude, the gradient with respect to longitude, and this edge detector or curvature from the Laplacian op operator. They, uh, and they do, and then they get four different um, coefficients to make a weighted average. They do this 16 different ways, so they have 16 different weighted averages, right? So there's 16 filters in the first layer. They do batch normalization, which I won't get into, but they basically normalize everything um, to keep the inputs close to one. They then put it through a ReLU nonlinearity, so anything which is less than zero gets clipped to zero, and then they drop, uh, and then and then the outputs are still layer four, right? So still 1.7 degrees. Then they downsample the results, which is to say they they reduce that from uh, 1.7 degree resolution to about 3.4 resolution. They drop from level four to level three, so they decrease resolution. And then they uh, perform some more convolutions, and then they go from 16 channels to 64. Then they drop the resolution again, so now they're, they're on an even coarser grid, right? So their triangles got bigger, but now they go from um, 64 channels to 256 channels. Then finally, they average all the channels in space, so they have 256 numbers. Then they put those 256 numbers through a feed-forward neural network with no spatial structure, and they get 10 outputs. And those 10 outputs are the probabilities that the original input data was each of the 10 digits. So what we're doing in this classifier is we're starting off with a high-resolution triangulation with only one channel. And as we go forward through the network, we're increasing the number of channels from 1 to 16 to 64 to 256. And while we're increasing the number of channels, we're decreasing the spatial resolution until we end up on something which is just a little bit finer, level two, than the original um, icosahedron. Okay. And they do this with 60,000 parameters. Okay, so this is how they did it. Um, and they got basically state-of-the-art results for the spherical MNIST task. Um, so... Um, if anyone has a question, just chime in. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next application, which is um, object categorization. So here, we're showing special data from uh, 3D cameras. So I believe we can see it here. They take the data from... Um, AutoCAD models of objects. Here's some kind of a table. And they say, okay, what if we image this object from the inside, from the middle, 
using a four channel camera where the, the cameras are red, green, blue, and depth. And these are actually, you really can buy such a camera that uses time of flight or infrared dot patterns and, and you can measure distance for each pixel. Um, and this is becoming a very popular topic related to self-driving cars and robotics and so on. But so given one of these, um, these images of the object, um, which I think I'm jumping ahead here. I, I, I'm mistaken, they don't use four channel. This is actually only distance. They take only the 3D structure of this table. But they convert it to uh, several channels. They ask, okay, if I start in the center, for each point of my sphere, how far do I have to go until I hit the object? And how far do I have to go until I hit a, a box surrounding the object? So these are our input data. And then depending on the shape of the object, we'll get a different uh, spherical data set. And then the idea is we have a whole bunch of different tables which are rotated in different views, maybe different sizes of tables. And then we get these distance maps and then the network is supposed to take one of these and output the probability that it's one of these different types of objects. I believe there's um, 40 different um, categories. So uh, basically a similar idea, you apply these convolutional networks, but instead of 10 categories for the 10 digits, now there's 40 classes. Um, and instead of one input channel for black or white, as we saw for these digits, we're now going to have um, three input channels related to the 3D structure that we're putting in. And it's supposed to classify what kind of object it is. And then we get these, uh, these really nice results. Um, so um, what we have is different versions of this network. Uh, they label theirs here ours. This is the, uh, the current you know, mesh-based 3D analysis. And we've got, um, they've got different versions as they, they increase or decrease the number of filters, number of, of hidden units in the network. Um, they can add more parameters and they get more and more accurate results. Uh, and they compare to some other methods which aren't quite as good. Um, so why do they want to look at the number of parameters? It's really good to have few parameters for several reasons. One reason is uh, we overfit less, right? The, the, the lower a ratio you have of parameters to data points, the less you worry about overfitting and therefore the better you're generalized to new data. Another reason is that the computation is faster, the training is faster, you can fit more data in memory when you're training. And then if you ultimately want to go to bigger input data sets which have more channels of input and maybe finer resolutions, so we go to level four, level five, level six, maybe grid sizes of half a degree, a tenth of a degree, you really struggle to fit all this stuff into memory. So having less parameters makes you more able to do that. Uh, so they're basically showing they get the best results for a given number of parameters comparing to all these um, other methods. So then there's one more task. The final task they look at is image segmentation. Um, and this is, I'm sorry, where they had the uh, red, green, blue distance, the four channel inputs. Um, here's an example of what um, the scenes might look like after labeling. So you have red, green, blue distance, and then you have all these different pixels are labeled by hand basically. Say, okay, this is a table, this is a ceiling, this is a chair, this is a door. And the neural network has to output the correct label um, for each pixel. So whereas before we were trying to guess which kind of object is it or which number is it for the whole image, now we want to do this for each pixel. So this is actually a much more challenging task. Um, and they have to use a slightly different architecture. So whereas before, you go to figure two here. Before, for the MNIST example and the object classification, we just, we decrease the level. That is, we decrease resolution while adding more channels. Here we're going to decrease while adding more channels, and then we reduce the number of channels while we increase resolution. So we go down and up, and this kind of architecture is called a UNET. If we quickly look in the supplementary material about how they did it, they say, okay, we start off Say we look at the, um, the pixel labeling. So what's a chair, what's a table, what's a ceiling? We have the four input channels, which are red, green, blue distance. And then we map, we, we calculate 32 convolutions. So 
32 different sets of these four coefficients for the identity, la latitude derivative, longitude derivative, and, um, and curvature. And we have a level five. So this is about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees. Then we reduce the resolution down to level four, down to 1.8 degrees, but we go uh, from 32 to 64 different channels, and we keep reducing, reducing, reducing until we get to level zero, which is just the original icosahedron, right? Just these points. And there we have 512 channels. Then we go back up, we reduce um, to 256 channels and, uh, and have a level one triangulation, and then to 512 channels, I'm sorry, down to 128 channels, level two, and then all, eventually we get all the way back up to level five with 32 channels, which we then map into the 15 categories um, representing the 15 different labels like doors, ceiling, chair, whatever. So we, we basically start off with a small number of channels, high resolution, we go to many channels, low resolution, and then back to few channels and high resolution. And this is a UNet. Um, so this is the architecture they use. And they get these really nice results. Um, we can see them right here that for a similar number of parameters are just way better um, than the other methods. This is for the pixel labeling task. They also do an earth science application where they input, I believe, the integrated uh, um, total moisture transporter and some other input channels, and then they identify atmospheric rivers and tropical cyclones um, in a data set which has been published. And using this approach, they're able to do much better than a convolutional net, which is just using a latitude longitude projection, um, even though they start out with the same data. So um, this you know, proves to be really effective. The last experiment they do is to say, okay, what if instead of using um, all four different filters, like the identity, latitude derivative, longitude derivative, and the curvature, what if I only use three or two of them? The very surprising result is that by stacking enough layers and keeping the number of parameters the same, they're actually able to do almost as well. I'm surprised this wasn't much worse. So I, I don't have a good intuition why this degraded so slowly, but um, they're able to go even simpler. So this is with four different coefficients, it's already much simpler than our three by three, nine coefficient filters. And they're able to go even simpler and maintain pretty decent accuracy. So that's, um, that's pretty surprising. Uh, before I, I open this up to questions, I'll just mention that part of the reason we picked this paper over a lot of other approaches is that they publish code online um, on GitHub to go along with this, this is PyTorch code. And you can actually see this is kind of the whole thing. Of course, they have to import the meshes and have a few utility functions. But basically, in less than 200 lines of code, they have all the, the, the key ideas, really maybe less than 100. You just compute these linear operations and you get these convolutional networks. It's extremely simple. Uh, you can download it, you can try it, and I know we intend to do this. One other last comment about this paper is that because it was a uh, a paper at the uh, International Conference on Learning Representations, ICLR, the reviews are open and you can see the open reviews and the discussions there uh, on the website, uh, the open review website, and we've linked that from the YouTube description. Um, so I'll open this up now to questions about the paper, comments, uh, what have you. I have a lot of questions that I couldn't answer, so maybe I'll ask the group, but let, let's hear from other people first. I'm, I'm getting a little tired of hearing my own voice. Um, what does everyone think of this paper? So you can type in the chat, you can uh, raise your hand. Yes, Christoph. I think this is a great paper. Um, dealing with climate data is always an issue um, coming from from pictures, as a as it do, was done before uh, in in machine learning. So I, I think this is really great and a great step forward. And and paper makes so interesting is that what what Tobias kind of mentioned that um, 
uh, a way, one way of dealing with grids into the future with high resolution grids um, is going to these specific grids of Heiko Zaidrin. Um, really special here to, to go that way. I know there are other papers out there, they try to go on a sphere um, with other aspects. So, but this makes it really special to, uh, but by, 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 by chance hit our uh, uh, system model. So that, that makes it really interesting um, just as a comment. And um, so, and, and, and as another comment, what, what I, I was dealing with in image in painting is that the edges of pictures are always a problem. And this was one, one thing I, in, in my task to kind of get an idea what's happening on the edges uh, if you if you put uh, the earth on a yeah kind of on a square basically so um, I'm really interested in if you guys go into the code do something with it uh, maybe make a PyTorch kind of library out of it I would be really interesting in using that and put it on image in painting um, that would be really, really cool. Um, so um, I, I would be more interested into that cam stuff, but so 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 the um, atmospheric river stuff and the, and so on. But uh, I have to be honest, I just flew over the paper before um, coming online. So, um, but if you if you want to discuss this more, I would be interested in that. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. So let me let me make sure I understand the point that. Um, so uh, Tobias Vigo made earlier, and now Chris, you're making too. With the icon model, you often have grids which are not uniform, right? So you have a triangulation, um, I believe it's triangular, maybe it's also hexagonal in some points, but but you can always divide a hexagon into triangles. But essentially, maybe over the open ocean, you have uh, like a broad spacing, but then over some care area where you care about impacts, like on the coasts or over cities, you have a much finer, um, a finer mesh and you have smaller triangles is that is that basically correct that's that that was kind of the main idea so we have always these global ocean um, ocean global earth system models and we have this regional uh, uh, models and the idea here was kind of to make it one model so that you can have the regionalization inside of the global model um, and that's what's what's happening there. So you so you, they, they, there's a region on Earth which is higher resoluted, basically the region you're interested in. It, it depends on the case you want to. You, for example, in weather forecasting, it's basically Europe for the German model. So mm. uh, that that makes a lot German. of sense because if we go back, so this is this is our polygon mesh processing textbook again. I mean, these derivatives are defined regardless of how the triangles are put together. They don't have to be the same size. They don't have to be any special regular pattern. And I believe the Laplacian is the same. It's nothing, um, it's nothing too, too fancy, really. Um, you know, it, you're estimating curvature. It's all linear. It shouldn't matter how many surrounding, whether you have five or six, um, or, or any other number of, of triangles that meet around your vertex. So in principle, you should be able to use this directly on your irregularly spaced mesh without any trouble. Of course, no one's tried it. So I think we actually just have to try it and, um, and see how that works. If we can just, without any interpolation or fidgeting, you know, build the kind of the, the areas of high impact into our, our mesh in the very beginning, that could be, um, that could be really interesting. Uh, from the chat, I'm seeing a question from Eduardo. Uh, in deep networks, there are subsequent steps, usually max pooling. Yeah, so I really kind of, I, I breezed over that. If I, leave, if I When we go back to the architectures, I talked about decreasing resolution, and that's basically a max pooling step. Um, um, it might have been a mean pooling, I, I have to see. They're calling it down sample. What is their... Their down sample, I believe, as defined in the legend of Figure Two, um, but it's either you can do any of these options. You can do um, um, max pooling. You can do, yeah, it's basically um, just uh, just sampling with a stride. So it's throwing out the intermediate values. Um, of course, this is different than it is on um, a latitude-longitude rectangular grid. Um, you know, 
if we actually look at what these triangulations look like, right? So suppose we have values at all these points and we want to reduce the resolution, then we're gonna throw out these inner triangle points and then we're gonna go down one level and just keep these outer ones. So we just basically have to um, throw away these inner points and just take the outer ones. So that's pretty simple, but of course it's a different module. It requires different code. I haven't looked deep enough into the code um, that the group has published um, to know how they literally just store and order everything in memory. They've got these nice clean functions, but um, how they actually store the arrays to represent the points on the, and how they, they upsample and downsample with their, um, their different levels. They haven't written it as a package you can install uh, with PIP or Conda, so maybe that's something for us to think about as well. And uh, maybe on that point, Tobias, you had something you wanted to add? Uh, no, not not uh, already covered by explaining uh, what, what what the um, uh, the the these interpolations with icon. So yeah. forget it. Oh, okay. But I do have other points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Wait. Oh, okay. Uh, so one one thing. Um, so in the appendix of the paper, they have. Just a very small tidbit about um, the the scalability efficiency. Uh, they have this table eight mm. in the appendix, and and the uh, so I was I was reading through the paper also with a, with an eye then on um, how much uh, how quick is this whole algorithm? So because in in a usual uh, convolutional approach. Basically, all of the operations that you do on the CPU or GPU is uh, some matrix operations. But here, I think it is not as simple as that. It is. It is more of. Uh, it's. It's more like dot products and stuff like that. Um, but what struck. What struck me here was in Table Eight, they are increasing the number of parameters, but they are just. Well, they don't give a lot of explanation to this table, but the runtime roughly stays constant. And it's also the same in the figure. And I think something is wrong here because, well, this would mean there is a sort of a constant, uh, some, some, some sort of um, uh, scaling involved. And simply, I don't believe that can be, right? You increase the number of parameters and the runtime doesn't change at all. Uh, something is wrong. Yeah, no, so it, it, it has to increase for sure. I mean, what it seems is that there's some other overhead which is unrelated to the number of parameters, but which is slowing things down. Presumably, if you kept increasing it and increasing it, it would get slower. I think it could be a lot of things. Um, it might just be the uh, transfer of data between the CPU and the GPU. It might be other operations like batch normalization or um, thresholding or something. Yeah, but you don't see it here. So this is... Uh, yeah, you'd uh, have to probably increase right, the number so. of parameters a lot more. And maybe you'd have to increase it so much that it wouldn't fit in memory anymore. Um, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to this. Um, ah, no. Okay, now I get it. Okay, so you're saying this the runtime here is caused by all of the overhead. It's not really the problem that is yeah. getting larger that is already causing this. So I, then, well, but, but that means it's huge. It is it's, it's it's significant over so i i think three milliseconds isn't so terrible for um something like this with all these different layers right um for we're starting i believe at at a, a you know 16 or 32 full divi uh, division of the icosahedron triangle so already pretty fine and then all these different le le levels it doesn't go back up it just goes back down we're only doing classification not not pixel labeling but um you know, it's a good question, what's, what's arising? There are tools, I think not the best tools, but there are tools for, for kind of profiling um, these tensor operations. If we look at their code, um, if we look at um, their operations code, you can see they're using a PyTorch library for sparse, um, sparse matrices. And this might be where sparse tensors and sparse uh, matrix operations um, kind of, I think this is basically to figure out which edges correspond to and which faces correspond to which vertices and to kind of store and manipulate the geometry. So it's not terribly slow. 
certainly if you compare it to the other method, this is, this is a point cloud method, which I'll touch on very briefly as we go over the, the survey. Um, it's, it's not terribly slow compared to this, but it's maybe it could be quicker. I have no idea if we just if we just compare it to a convnet on latitude longitude, which presumably wouldn't work as well, um, would that be much quicker? I don't know the answer to that. Um, on the one hand, it would have this seems to have fewer parameters, so that might make it quicker. On the other hand, maybe this this overhead is significant. It's, it's a very good point. Well, or or they made some error in implementing this. It it seems a bit fishy to me. So this is why I was a bit concerned. Yeah. Also. Well, because also think about that earlier table about the um, this study where they where they just leave out some of the uh, parameters uh, that last what what did they call it um, ablation the ab so that is also quite odd so it could just be that um, whatever they're doing here is something is wrong with the with the parameter calculations. It's possible. I'm not entirely I mean, sure. They, they got pretty good results for a wrong answer, so maybe it would have been even better. Um, it's a good question, and I think I think to, to really understand what this method is capable of, what its limitations are, one would want to pursue answer to these questions. What, what is taking so long? How is it managing to do things without using all four of these operators? Um, so it could be if you if you're if you're looking into the code and if if uh, as you said you you would like to. Uh, if some some sort of re-implementation of that or or apply it to i don't know to icon or whatever so in in that case i would be would wary that there may still be some big bug in there or something something that is well hopefully not conceptually wrong but something something seems not yeah just a suspicion well this is a general issue with machine learning methods where you train the parameters that often if you make a big mistake on the architectural level sometimes the method can work anyway because you're training yep. and adjusting the parameters. So in fact, you may not always realize your mistake. Yep. Um, so I have, let me mix in one of my questions, um, which is a very general conceptual one, which is, okay, what is this good for? In that we've seen examples of classification of the whole image, right? Is this a, is this a three or a seven? Is it a picture of a, is it a 3D model of a chair or a table? Um, we've seen something a little bit more sophisticated where we classify each each pixel in the input. Like so in the spherical data set, where is the ceiling? Where is the chair? Where is the wall? But I would like to see how this does on a real image to image mapping where I don't just want the correct labels, but I want quantitative outputs. For example, if I'm predicting a temperature field or, or, or something like that, um, or, or something from molecular modeling, what, how does that work? Because even in the climate science example, they're only identifying which pixels contain a, um, a, an atmospheric river or a tropical cyclone. So they, I would really like to know where, uh, to predict something that actually has real data units and how would it do in this case? Um, so uh, this is an open question. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that or other questions. Uh, here's Chris again. Yeah. Um, I'm, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I, and I totally agree. I, I'm always a little bit sick of this is a table or this is a cat, something like this, right? I mean, we, we have methods to, to find a hurricane without, uh, without having machine learning, right? So, um, but I'm, I see this, this is, has a big thing on image in painting. If we go to data sets which have missing data sets, so uh, missing data points here. And, um, so so um, old climate data sets or even even in data assimilation on weather prediction or something like that. And we fill in these gaps here on a sphere. Um, that could have a huge impact. Um, mm -hmm. And there you are on the on the on a temperature field or humidity field or something like that, um, I, I'm pretty sure that there is a there's there's a need for the next step here um, to, to bring it in that way. And so it's not it's not the classification problem anymore. Um, but I think if we close that gap between these two things, that could be could be huge. Hmm. Hmm. So. 
I want to ask be, be, because on yeah. uh, just just to to to, to yeah. give my example again. So if you're on a square, you put the Earth on a uh, on Im image in painting or these scan networks or whatever. Um, you have always the problem on the edges, and um, uh, so, so if you're if you if you are on the on the poles so on the Antarctica or Arctic, or if you are on the side on this on kind of on zero degree or 360 or something like that. You have always problems on these edges with these things and put that on a sphere would be just great. So, and and we have methods to do it on, so we have to do, we have the methods to do the climate science on a square yet. And we have these methods on a sphere, which are developed right now. And as I, as I said before, there are more than this um, ecosahedra. However, I, I really like that stuff. Um, so, and if we close that gap, that could be something. So, so image in painting, so um, kind of re reconstruction of missing values in climate data sets, basically, um, could be one 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 thing you you ask for. All right, that's yeah, that that sounds really promising. Um, um, I think um, if so we're running a little over time, not too badly, but I think this is maybe a good point to quickly overview a few papers of alternative approaches. I think I'll go over a few, and Marcel, you'll also go over a few. Um, and then at the end, we can come back to questions on the main paper, or on these, or just general discussion. Um, I'm really gonna go very fast, just kind of tell you what exists um, that I've found out, although this, this won't be a complete survey at all. Um, the, the first thing I want to go over is this cube sphere approach, which has already been used in a very practical sense and is getting some state of the art uh, results in, um, in earth sciences. So doing weather prediction uh, on a cube sphere, uh, getting these nice um, neural networks, which can be kind of fed into themselves to do long range predictions in a stable way, which wasn't really possible before. And the idea is pretty simple. Instead of using an icosahedron, they use a cube. So they, they put a cube inside their sphere, they map all the points in the sphere onto the cube, and then they've got six faces of the cube. So then on each face, they just treat it as you know, a regular 2D grid and they do convolutions on it using regular convolutional filters with the moving filters as we saw uh, before. Uh, so what are, pardon me, um, the, Advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is simple. You can use regular 2D convolutional filters, which are very well developed. They run very quickly and in a memory efficient way on GPUs. Um, you can be very flexible there. Um, the issues are, there's a few issues with this approach though. One is, okay, you still have some distortions within each one of these faces. Less than if you traded the whole thing as a single face, but you still do have more close spacing of points at the top than in the middle of each of these. And it's uh, even more severe when you look at the polar faces uh, than if you look at the equatorial faces. Another issue is this. If I have a three by three filter, right? Let me zoom in a little. Um, if I have a three by three filter, here's my center, right? And this is where I want to predict the output. So I have a three by three filter where I just sample, you know, up, left, and up to the left, right? That works here. Okay, no problem. I, I look at all these these nine values, the eight surrounding values, including the point I want to predict. That works fine here. What happens here when I want to predict the output here? I can go right, down to the right, down, no problem. If I want to go left, no problem. I just go to the next phase. If I want to go up, I go here. What if I want to go up and left? What if I want to do the upper left corner of the filter? Where do I go? There's no, there's no, there's no grid cell here. So what they do in practice is they just use this cell here, which is fine. It's kind of an arbitrary choice. It leads to some distortions. Uh, you could say, okay, it only affects the corners, but when you stack many of these layers on top of each other, these distortions and errors are going to spread to the outputs of the entire um, space. Um, so as a result, it doesn't quite work as well in some uh, examples. Um, it didn't work um, as, uh, yeah. Um, but, um, but, but it, it's, it's a reasonable approach and it's simple. And I think on where it's actually been applied, uh, it seems to be the cutting edge method right now. Uh, one other 
issue, which isn't really good or bad, uh, it can be both maybe, is that they use different filters for the equatorial faces and the polar faces. Uh, so they, they're able to learn the, um, I mean, the filters all have an up, down, left, right. It's a sort of ill-defined for the polar faces, like which way should be up? Should it be this way or this way? Uh, geometrically, they're sort of the same, but they have to define one way. Um, and they learn one set of filters to use here, one to learn here. This adds flexibility, but it also increases the parameter count, which is not always desirable, as we discussed before. Then I'm going to talk about just one, uh, uh, so two more approaches. One is cores et al., what they call um, sphere net. Uh, here. So what they do is is quite simple and clever. So if you were to take a regular grid in latitude longitude, you can see that your filter deforms as you move toward the pole. So what they say is, well, instead of just taking the grid on the latitude longitude rectangular projection, I'm going to take a tangent plane to the sphere and then project down at each point. So I'm actually moving the points around. So here at the equator, I'm basically taking a three by three grid of points and multiplying that by my filter. When I get close to the pole, I'm actually going several um, longitude values to the left and the right. So I'm skipping over some values. I'm adjusting the size of my convolutional filter as I apply it to the data based on the distortions to try to compensate them. And then to do this, I basically have to interpolate between the data points. So then they use bilinear interpolation to sample the data at non-integer values. Um, you know, they store those coefficients and it's all very efficient. For whatever reason, it did perform worse on, um, if we look at the present paper again, if we look at the MNIST paper, uh, the MNIST example, it did perform worse. Um, and it's not really clear to me why. It may have to do with the interpolation. There's maybe some other reason. Uh, it's worth investigating this, but it didn't do as well um, if we... Um, if we compare, in fact, it did significantly worse for MNIST despite using more than three times as many parameters. Uh, why this is, is not clear to me. Um, and then finally, there are point cloud-based methods. So we talked already about, for this Jang et al. paper, how great it is that we have these meshes, they can have any structure. As long as they're just a bunch of connected triangles, it doesn't matter and we can work with them. But it's possible to be even more flexible. And it's possible to even have a point cloud without any edges, without any triangles. We just have values at a bunch of points. And I won't go into the mathematical details, but yes, it is possible to train neural networks to take point clouds and produce outputs like category labels or, or values on the points or what have you. Um, and this generally doesn't work quite as well um, it, when you don't have that structure. The, there's a few methods like this. Uh, one of them is point net plus plus. Um, there is one case where they do better, which is notable, and that's this DGCNN. This is kind of the most sophisticated point cloud, um, which takes into account kind of like no local neighborhoods of points, uh, and it only shows up in one table. And that's the reason, uh, the reason for that is because there's no code to run it, so they just have to take the numbers out of the, um, the paper. Let me see if I can find it here. Um... Yeah, so this is a one case where the method is beaten by a little bit, and this is for the predicting of is this a table, is this a chair, whatever, from the 3D models uh, from AutoCAD. And, um, and basically, uh, it is slightly better, and it's, it's worth asking, where does it lie along this curve, right? So, and I looked it up, um, and I looked it up in the DGCNN paper, they use about five and a half million parameters. So they're roughly here right at the end. So one, two, three, actually just off the curve. So they use more parameters than any other method. Their time for a computation after training is 27 milliseconds compared to the three milliseconds uh, that we took independent of parameter count. So it's nine times slower. It's several times more parameters, but it is better. And this is worth noting. I think if you have enough training data, these point cloud methods might be better. They also note this when, when looking at the, um, the pixel labeling. So where's the table, where's the chair, where's the ceiling? They find that the, um, the point cloud, this is not DGCNN because they couldn't run it, but they were able to run point net plus plus, a simpler point cloud based method. And it didn't do nearly as well, but they say this is probably because of limited training data. So the point cloud based methods might be better if you have a ton of training data, but otherwise these other approaches 
might be better. So that's all I've got. Um, Marcel, if you're there, I'll turn over to you to discuss a couple other papers. Uh, yeah, I'm there. I just wanted to ask one more question, maybe for the point cloud method. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the example, how they projected the data from this classification data set onto the sphere, I assume that the point cloud method directly worked with the point clouds of the objects, right? Which might be way more natural to work with than just projecting the it's a good question. Um, I wonder if any of these comparisons are fair. If you force one algorithm to use the data format of the other and then trying to transfer to its own format, some information may get lost. The point clouds for this example, um, so you're talking about for the um, model net 40, where you're doing categorization of the whole image, or are you talking about the segmentation where you label each pixel? Uh, the model net 40. Yeah, so in this case, the data comes from AutoCAD, so it should be a mesh already. Um, so I don't know if the point cloud is a more natural format. Um, so they would just, in this, in this left figure, they would just work with the point cloud of the cupboard or the little table and not with the sphere on the right side. Right? Well, uh, this is, I, you know, I don't. They might actually take the sphere and they provide that distance data to the point cloud as uh, kind of the sphere coordinates and values. Or they might just go and directly provide the points on in the AutoCAD diagram. I don't know. We can quickly check and see. They have a little bit about the implementation of the other methods. So point of um, so for DGCNN, I don't know. They're just taking the number out of um, this other paper, which we'd have to look at. But for point cloud, um, for point net plus plus, they're using eight one nine two points. Same number of points for form data by rotating around the z axis to have subregions for training. I'm really not sure. It's a good question. Okay, just saying it might be a natural advantage here for the point cloud methods. Yes, I, 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 would, I would take all of this, I would not draw any conclusions from any of these papers um, from what I've read to say this method is better, this method is better. You can pull out some general trends. Um, like the point cloud methods need a lot of training data. Um, you know, if you don't want, if, if being upside down matters, don't use a rotation invariant network. But in terms of what's really better for the number of parameters, I want to look very carefully about how the data was prepared and was it really fair and, and so on. Um, yeah, these are, these are really good questions. Okay, so Marcel, you want to carry on with these other papers? I'm going to stop uh, yeah, screen sharing so you can take the screen over one second uh, where am I? yeah okay i just um collected some um some slides so i don't have to flip back and forth between different uh papers so much um but i'm gonna be quick about it so um as christopher already mentioned Typically, it's not good to take stuff that's on a sphere and then just put it on the plane for a classical convolution. Um, that might work kind of that maps usually onto rectangular regions as well. Um, the further we go to the poles, as Christopher already mentioned, the more distortions we have. In the extreme case, this upper um, this upper edge here is actually all just one point. So. Um, it's been, that, that's been uh, appreciated for a few years, um, that you can't just evolutions on, on flattened uh, spheres. Um, so the question is, what do you do instead? Um, and the idea is that you want to look at spheres and you want to also get the correct invariance and equivariances that are relevant there. So quickly to mention what, what we mean with equivariance and invariance, so in the sphere, um, when you can do a lot of the uh, very naturally, what actually naturally corresponds to translation on the plane is rotation. So if you rotate uh, your sphere and the surface of it, um, you want to be your out, you want your output to be invariant to that. Um, or if you do actually uh, image to image regression task, um, you want your output to actually rotate along with, with the input. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about equivariance in this case, and I'm going to talk quickly about 
two papers um, that have actually both, well, at least the first one has already shown up um, as a comparison in the other paper before. And then there's a second one also with the icosahedron um, that try to capture these. Um, the first one, uh, spherical CNNs uh, from Cohen and Max Welling, 2018. Um, it goes this way of uh, defining a convolution on the sphere. Um, so quickly, just to give you a very rough overview of the, of the main equation. So we have filters. Um, they are discretized on angles uh, along longitudes and latitudes. Um, we have different channels. And these get convolved. And what this convolution means, we, we see here on the right-hand side. These get convolved with the input map. Um, and the function now is not a translation, so you don't um, get the map out of this where the individual points on the map mean position, but where the individual points mean relative rotations of the, of the filters um, relative to the input map. And so they, they defined this, um, this convolution over rotations. And what they then showed is um, that for this type of convolution, you have this classical Fourier analysis result that if you take the Fourier transform, the generalized Fourier transform in this case of the convolution, then in the Fourier space, you end up with a dot product. And this is the basis for their way of doing a convolutional network is they take their inputs, they do a fast Fourier transform, they take their kernels, they do a fast Fourier transform, then they do this matrix product, and they have something to do with probably storing them and adding information across channels. And then they do the backward transform. And this way they have done their convolution on the sphere. And there's um, a bunch of details regarding the mathematics that I'm gonna glance over. But the idea is that this way, um, it is actually invariant to rotations. Um, and you can use this convolutional stage as a building block again, as we've seen before, so you can build residual networks out of this with several residual blocks uh, and different numbers of features that uh, as before, they usually increase the feature size as they go deeper in the layers. Um, it is rotation invariant um, with all the cons and all the, the downsides of it, as we've already heard before. If you are rotation invariant then you might have problems distinguishing a nine from a six because the filter is actually really invariant to that. Um, the paper itself, is more than halfway is really just theory on continuous signals. Um, they do a bunch of uh, really in-depth uh, derivations that their stuff works. Um, but by the end of the day, what they do is they, um, they discretize the surface as you can maybe already see here with this nine. Um, and then they introduce a bunch of discretization errors. And in particular, they introduce another hyperparameter of the, net, of the network um, that you also see here in this table, and that's the maximum bandwidth. It's like in the Fourier transform, the, the highest frequency that you're looking at. And usually you have to choose this bandwidth um, in correspondence with your spatial frequency. So in the classical Fourier transform, it's your Nyquist frequency. And in this case, they choose it more in terms of um, just convenience and computational costs. So it's not entirely clear how to pick that and what it costs you if you don't actually have enough bandwidth. Um, but they, they, they have a bunch of examples where they show that it's not that important, but it's a bit unclear uh, how freely. And, and the second one, which is the, the more recent, uh, sorry, this is 2019, um, the more recent paper is a uh, gauge and very equivariant convolutional networks. These aren't just equivariant with respect to um, global rotations and such, but these are equivariant with respect to gauges. And that's it's its own field, and um, I'm gonna glance over it. I'm also, to be honest, I would also not be able to just explain it from, from um, the get-go right now. Um, so the idea there is that you have gauges which are local coordinate systems that change smoothly as you go over the surface of your manifold. And here we have as the manifold uh, visualization, we have the sphere, but the theory that they actually develop in the first part of the, of the paper is uh, much more broad, uh, much, much more broad. It works on almost any manifold with a local gauge structure. And one of the reasons, just a, this is a very quick teaser why you would care for this, 
um, on the sphere is that on the sphere you don't have this property that's called parallel transport. So if you go from one point to another on two different paths, um, you might end up with different coordinate systems where you end up. So this is why the, these gauges, these local coordinate systems in the tangent space uh, are kind of rel uh, kind of thing. They're important, and they're usually just ignored. Um, so they take a closer look at this. They develop beautiful theory. Um, we will ignore most of this. Uh, we will just uh, quickly go to their one application where they break this down and actually implement this. This is again the icosahedron uh, with these twenty surfaces as we've seen before. And as we've seen before, they didn't do 2D convolutions on this. They went away from 2D convolutions and instead did these linear combinations of these predefined um, manually selected features. By the end of the day, the identity, the um, derivative in X and in Y direction it was. Um, and then this, the second order term here, they actually do 2D convolutions. So the full layer, what it does in, in kind of pseudocode is it does a classical conf2d as it is implemented in Torch and in uh, TensorFlow, um, but it doesn't do it directly on, on the signal itself and it doesn't do it directly with um, the weights. There's some tricks involved there. Um, so the way that they operate is they say like, look, even if you have these high order icosahedrons with very many um, triangles on an individual phase, if you go to very high orders, you have a lot of triangles, um, but within these individual faces, we have a plane and you could do 2D convolutions on there. And you can even do this uh, for more than one phase. Um, so here you have uh, these, um, what they call charts. Um, all of these charts together cover the entire surface. Um, and an individual chart is several of these neighboring faces. And if you just slightly, tilt them and you stack them, then you actually have something that is uh, a matrix, a 2D structure over which, sorry, over which you can do your convolutions. There's a lot of tricks, um, like you have to do padding again. And there's this problem that in this case, because you're inside the area, um, the things you wanna pad with, they actually show up somewhere else inside. So you have to copy um, stuff over rather smartly. And there's a lot of weight tying um, that has to happen for this to work. Um, so they work with three by three convolutions and as I explained before, um, you have problems when you run into the edges. So you, you zero out some of these kernel elements and you have to do a lot of weight tying to make sure that these convolutions actually compute the same thing on all of the charts and stuff. Um, so as I said before, this is uh, much more theory driven work and the icosahedron uh, is just one current application that I've done. Um, in principle, there's much more applications, but it's, it's, it's not been done so far. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. That was great. I, I have one quick question about the um, the gauge invariant stuff. So I mean, it's it's really impressive. I agree that the theory is just incredibly beautiful. It seems potentially very powerful too. What what I'm a little less clear on is um, well, for one, I wish they would have shared code. So far, there's no code for this. Uh, I mean, some really nice looking results, but um, but not actually any um, any code that we can try out. Um, but aside from this, so let me pull up this paper. So the, the main thing they compare it to is the paper we did today, um, Jang et al. And, you know, they talk about, oh, we have this big, you know, substantial improvements over previous methods. If you actually look at the numbers, they're only a little bit better. Um, so if you compare their experiments, um, where they actually do compare to the other methods, okay, they have a slight increase in accuracy, okay. They have a slight increase in accuracy, no, not so slight, a few percent is a solid actually when you're already that good. Um, this is for the climate pattern segmentation. So they're, they're a little bit better, uh, but I wouldn't say it's dramatic. Um, the other thing I'm really not clear on is how expensive this method is. You know, how much memory does it take? How long does it take to train? If you look at the description of the training, 
they just say we trained for 15 epochs with batch size 15. To me, my instinct is it means this was very expensive and they used some special hardware and they really did a lot of computation to get this to work. But I really don't know. I don't know if Marcel, if you have any perspective on this, how difficult it is to get this going. Um, so the nice thing about this is that it's on a uh, standard uh, 2D convolution. So they do have a segment where they actually say how it maps onto uh, standard tensors for 2D. Hmm. Um, it does seem to blow up the number of channels hmm. by a lot. Uh, um, blow up the image size a bit. Regarding the number of parameters, well, if you have more channels, then you have also more parameters. But as I said, they have strong weight as many free parameters as um, the numbers of the sizes of the um, of the parameter tensors in memory might um, suggest. And regarding the direct comparisons uh, of the performance with the other methods, um, there's two things that one should always mention there. So in this particular case, um, the theory is much more general. So it's not too surprising that Strongly beat other more specialized methods for running on the sphere or running on the icosahedron. Um, the theory is more general and it usually costs you. Hmm. And the other thing is when numbers are so close to each other as they are, it's always also a bit of a influence of how hard people try <laughs> yeah. and how long they tweak. Um, so yeah. it's rough to say. You can see there's a congeniality between these two labs. They both put each other in the um, announcements of their, uh, the acknowledgments of their papers. And I would also plug that Max Welling did a podcast on this technique, which I will put in the YouTube description and the webpage um, as well. Chris, you have a question? Yeah, I just want to comment on that too. Um, I mean, there's, there's always the problem that if you have good results, you don't question them, right? So. Uh, hard to kind of beat the others uh, other way around so if you're if you're less good so and then you have that one percentage maybe uh, and then you say you're better than the, the others um this is always i, I think that this is just a comment and i i think phrase a question out of this what you guys are discussing right now which is i think really important for for our community um we some science if we go now to these methods um which which all seem kind of competitive, I would say. Um, you, you mentioned that they are not really far from each other, right? So, um, I mean, they say I'm better in this and I'm better in this. As a, as a climate scientist, you usually say, okay, I want the best one. But if it's, if, if it's a little less good, I mean, really a little less, and it all looks like this here, I would pre prefer the one which is the easiest to, to make an application out of it, right? So, and so um, if it's too calm, just a little bit more, I wouldn't use that. I mean, we have, we have so many problems and uncertainties in our climate system um, and in the modeling. So I would, I would rather use the, the most easiest to make an application out of it then. Um, so, and this is kind of the question. So how do we, how do we pick now stuff here? Uh, and how do we translate these results to our problems? Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I, I'm also for getting something going quickly, um, even if it's a little bit less elegant. Um, I think this is why also I, I really wanted to cover this Jang paper in detail, because it seems to have a nice compromise between doing something that makes sense and isn't totally arbitrary, but um, there's code, it's not too complicated in area diet. Um, uh, Tobias, you wanted to say something too? Yeah, so so um, good points here. I mean, uh, the 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 first paper, the the, the chunk paper. I, I I thought, well, okay, so this is the most general solution. This is driven from the mathematical point of view. It's sort of the the optimum. 
And um, well, the code, as, as you presented it as well, it looks fairly easy. Although I'm, as I also expressed, I'm still a bit skeptic about the the computational complexity. My question would then be, okay, it's it's the conceptually to me it sounds like the the conceptual optimum, but indeed maybe there are others that are much more straightforward to implement because they reuse the existing libraries in a much nicer way or the existing workflow like that so just this example of this this cubed sphere perhaps again well it it it's just convolutions in a matrix just just projected in some some nice way and yes there is something bad about it but maybe it is much more straightforward to implement and maybe it is much more efficient computationally than than the optimal solution but i mean at this point i also cannot say we, we'd sort of at the codes in detail and and make comparative implementation studies somehow or just pick one where we think this is where we want to go and just focus on that because maybe it's too much of a hassle to go through all of that evaluation if they if they don't uh, as you said if the differences are just just very small uh, yeah that makes a lot of sense um, yeah, I, I completely agree. What, one question I have about the Jang method is um, we talked about applying it to a mesh, which is uh, points in a sphere. You know, there's fine triangulation starting from the icosahedron. What's not totally clear in my mind is what if you actually go back to a planar grid of squares, uh, you divide those squares into triangles, and then you're back to the original setup of a normal convolutional network. At that point, can the Jang method actually implement something like a regular convolutional filter if you put in enough layers? I'm actually not sure. Um, I'm also not sure. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an experiment that one could do, right? Um, uh, you know, have train it to try to reproduce the convolutional output and, and see what happens. Um, can it, I mean, it can probably do an X derivative. It, can, it, can it do something more fancy? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, there seems to be an assumption with these derivatives too, that the grid, the mesh is fine enough that talking about a derivative makes sense. And how fine it actually has to be for your data is also not so clear. Um, um, I had a few other technical issues, but I think I'd wanna, I really wanna play with this uh, architecture a bit and then see see what I'm able to, to make happen. Um, so we've gone pretty long. I found this really interesting discussion though. Do anybody else have any general questions about the papers, about the topics? Uh, otherwise, I wanna to touch on one or two organizational things before we close. Can even be something aesthetic like, oh, I found this approach ugly. I found this approach very elegant. Well, as I said, I found the, the first paper. I also see the points about uh, questions on implementation. So, well. All right. Um